Two, one. Seven things you don't really need to know, but probably should. I'm Jamie East, and this, this is the Sunday Sun. In today's episode, we hear from researchers regrowing amputated limbs, scientists are facing a new and unexpected challenge with space travel, and the UK welcomes a new furry Aussie resident. But first, it was this week in 2004 that Mark Zuckerberg launched Facebook from his Harvard dorm room. Who knew that 18 years later it would become one of the largest and most influential tech companies to ever be founded? Humans regrowing limbs sounds like something out of a science fiction movie, but researchers may be closer to making it a reality. Just a handful of animals are able to naturally regrow limbs, but now a new experimental technique is helping amphibians replace their lost body parts, and scientists are hopeful that their work could someday make human limb regeneration a real possibility. The animal kingdom is divided into a set of animals that can regenerate very well, like axolotls or some species of lizards. And then the other group of animals like us, where we don't have any regenerative capacity. My name is Dr. Narosha Murugan. I'm an assistant professor in the health sciences, and my research focuses on regenerative medicine and cancer biology. In the study recently published in Science Advances, Narosha and her fellow researchers at Tufts and Harvard University first amputated the leg of an adult female African clawed frog and then coated the stump with a special five-drug cocktail. What we developed was a technology comprised of a device and a cocktail of drugs that was to kickstart those latent pathways that were there in the earlier developmental stages without having to reapply those drugs. And it was just sort of like a key to a car where we turn on the engine and we let the system take over to regrow that leg. They let the wound soak in the solution for 24 hours, and then over the next year and a half, the researchers watched as the adult frog regrew what seemed to be a functional leg. So it's not perfect. We're not quite there yet. And, you know, with just this one individual treatment, or acute treatment, I should say, we're able to get this really high complexity in the shape. We're still missing some key structures like the nail and the webbing, particular to the frog. But the exciting part is that inside of the leg we're getting pieces of that tissue like the nerve coming back the bone and the blood vessels coming back that hasn't been shown in the past with this model system although the regenerated leg wasn't perfect it sounds like human limb regeneration could potentially be achievable in our lifetime we're still ways away from that happening but i think we're moving in the right direction um potentially in our lifetime or you know soon after very close i would say um Again, this is just a one, one-shot one treatment, and it would be great to kind of see how multiple treatments, multiple different cocktails, how we can expand this um, treatment paradigm to kind of modulate different aspects of regeneration. So it is possible, but, you know, obviously more work needs to be done. we're now one step closer to mind-controlled robots. Goodness me. At the Swiss Technology Institute, EPFL, two research groups teamed up to develop a machine learning program that can be connected to a human brain and used to command a robot. Professor Ord Billard is the head of EPFL's Learning Algorithms and Systems Laboratory and led the study. The goal of this research is to develop now an interface for people who cannot control robots, but who need robots to help them in their daily life to be able to control them through their brain. So we are really trying to put together robotics and machine learning or artificial intelligence. And so we use the brain decoding to tell us when the robot is doing something good or something wrong. So the person does not have to use his or her member to move the robot. Imagine someone handicapped who cannot move the robot but would like the robotic arm to fetch things for him or her. Essentially, the program adjusts the robot's movements based on electrical signals from the brain. But that doesn't come easily, as robotics engineer Jason Batsianoulis explains. The most challenging thing was to make the link between the brain activity and the actions of the robot. And for doing that, we have developed a machine learning system that uses artificial intelligence in order to translate what the human considers as error to what would be the most preferable actions for the robot. 
To develop their system, the researchers started with a robotic arm that could already move back and forth, right to left, reposition objects in front of it, and even get around objects in its path. It's pretty impressive as it is, but for the researchers' purpose, they wanted it to learn how to better avoid obstacles. There are two ways in which you can avoid obstacles. Either you come close to them, right? You just slide past the obstacle because you're in a hurry, or you try to keep really away from obstacle. This is your user preference. We decided to use this because this is a very subtle information which you cannot transcribe. You know, the too close, too far is not something that has a mathematical value. So we wanted a robot to be able to infer that automatically from just the brain saying, I don't like it. If someone perceives that the robot would hit the glass, there would be some specific brain activity. We have a system that understands this specific brain activity. So it says the robot, don't move close to the glass, move away from the glass. And in this moment, the robot adapts its trajectory to avoid the glass. In the study, they programmed a robot to avoid obstacles, but they say they could have selected any other kind of task, like filling a glass of water or pushing and pulling an object. So for now, of course, it's a prototype, but the long-term goal is to allow people who are fully handicapped, who cannot move their, you know, their arms, typically people who may have lost control through the spinal cord of the upper body or the lower body, to be able to transfer that to either a wheelchair or to a robotic arm that is supporting them. Still to come on the Sunday 7, the problem of space anemia and the World Health Organization calls for COVID waste caution. The next giant leap for humans may be a trip to Mars, but having enough oxygen-carrying red blood cells for the journey might present a bit of a challenge. Astronauts already face their fair share of danger by hurling themselves into space, but new research is now highlighting a different kind of threat, anemia. Astronauts already experienced space anemia, a red blood cell deficiency, whilst on missions, but until now it was thought to be temporary. Doctors thought it could be down to a process called hemolysis, the destruction of red blood cells as the astronauts' bodies accommodated to weightlessness. But Dr Guy Trudell from the University of Ottawa, who led a study of 14 astronauts, says this anemia is much more impactful. We thought we knew about space anemia, and we did not. We had assumed that this was a a very quick phenomenon of adaptation and nothing was going on. And now we're discovering that's not the case. Space has a primary specific effect on red blood cell regulation. Normally, the body destroys and replaces nearly 2 million red blood cells per second. Trudell's team found that astronauts' bodies instead destroyed 3 million per second during their six-month missions. The message is there's a knowledge gap here that we need to fill in terms of the mechanism, in terms of the countermeasures, in terms also of the, uh, the planning of the mission. Uh, so, so will we need some blood products or artificial blood products on board uh, the mission to Mars, uh, given, this, given the, the fact that there is destruction ongoing? Would we need iron supplements at one point if we can't recycle all of the iron to make new red blood cells and so on? Whilst having fewer red blood cells in space isn't so much of a problem when your body's weightless, after landing on Earth and potentially on other planets, anemia could affect astronauts' energy, endurance and strength. And these effects could be long-lasting. Trudell's team also reported that a year after returning to Earth, the astronauts' red blood cells hadn't completely returned to pre-flight levels. And with space tourists already lining up for short trips, Trudell and his team are on a mission of their own to fix the problem. Discarded syringes, used test kits and old vaccine bottles from the COVID-19 pandemic have created tens of thousands of tonnes of medical waste, a World Health Organization report said on Tuesday. It says the medical waste materials are a threat to both human health and the environment, potentially exposing health workers to burns, needle stick injuries and disease-causing germs. Communities close to poorly managed landfills could also be at risk through contaminated air from burning waste, poor water quality or pests. 
Here's who Technical Officer Dr Maggie Montgomery speaking with Reuters. We found that COVID-19 has increased healthcare waste loads in facilities to up to 10 times current volumes. Um, and we, you know, if you consider that two in three healthcare facilities in the least developed countries didn't have systems to segregate or safely treat waste before the pandemic, um, you can just imagine how much burden this extra waste load has put on healthcare workers, on surrounding communities, especially where, where waste is burned um, with the release of Daxon and Dr Montgomery also says that a misconception about the rates of COVID infection from surfaces was to blame for what she called the overuse of protective gear, particularly gloves. The report mentions some 140 million test kits with the potential to generate over 266 tonnes of mostly plastic trash. To combat this, the report calls for reform and investment to reduce the use of plastic packaging and for protective gear to be made from reusable and recyclable materials. Still to come on the Sunday 7, astronomers discover what they think could be a new star and the UK welcomes the first southern koala to be born in Europe. Right after this. You're listening to the Sunday 7. Follow us for your weekday news espresso or even try our island edition. It's in all the usual places. Deep in the night sky, there's an object in space that has astronomers stumped. Out in the Milky Way, they found a mysterious spinning object blinking on and off every 18 minutes. Using a low-frequency radio telescope in the West Australian outback, researchers saw that an object about 4,000 light-years away was releasing huge bursts of energy every 20 minutes or so. So when I found something that was there and then not there, it was a tremendously spooky moment because there's nothing that we know about that, that behaves this way. That was Natasha Hurley-Walker, a radio astronomer at the Curtin University International Centre for Radio Astronomy Research. Now, these kinds of objects were predicted to exist. They're called ultra-long period magnetars, but nobody ever expected to find one. We thought they would be rare or invisible or just you'd never see it. Um, and certainly no one ever expected one to be so bright, let alone so bright an undergraduate student could find it in their project. We only know one at the moment, but we're probably going to find more. And that will allow us to explore this hidden population of neutron stars in our galaxy. Or alternatively, it's an object we don't even, we, like it could be something we've never even thought of. And then we'll be exploring this entirely new population of exotic phenomena. For me as a human, it's about being surprised by the universe. We can still find new things. We can still have that sense of wonder when we look up at the sky. The world produces more than 380 million tonnes of plastic every year, and by some reports, more than a third of that is for products used once and then tossed away, ending up as litter or landfill. Some 10 million tonnes of this plastic ends up in the ocean each year, littering beaches and endangering sea life. Most people assume that plastics, which are branded on the market as compostable or biodegradable, that you can just throw them in your backyard, or when you're on a hike, just throw them in a bush, and they'll degrade over time. That's not true. If you do that, it'll take many, many years to wait before anything will happen. And even then, it'll break down to microplastics, which will pollute our environments and our bodies. That's Ivan J. Aperna, a graduate student on the research team at UC Berkeley. Led by Professor Ting Zhu, the research team's come up with a truly compostable plastic. They found a way to embed enzymes in it so that once the bag or cup's no longer wanted, it'll be able to self-destruct. We put them inside our plastic, and now they're much more easily degradable either in home compost or in industrial compost solutions, or even in water that's heated up. And when they break down, they don't result in any microplastics. So how are these plastic eating enzymes activated? To decompose the plastic, simply put your plastic bags into warm water, leave it for days to weeks, and it'll break down into the individual building blocks of the plastic, such that these can actually be collected and remade into new plastics. The reason we have a plastic problem is because plastics are really great. 
They are used in all kinds of medical applications. I think it saves lives in terms of like helmets and other things like that. So if we can present a solution of a truly compostable plastic, hopefully we can then actually start to phase out fossil fuel based plastics and make these biodegradable plastics with our added protected enzymes in it more widespread for use. One thing I'm super excited about going forwards is seeing how this technology works its way into the market. Where's its first use going to be? We don't have a hundred years to solve the plastic waste crisis. We have to act now. And I believe that with the innovations that we've made, along with innovations made from other research groups, we can do it. I want to be involved in it and I want to see it happen. Tiny little Aussie is turning heads on the other side of the world this week after making history. It's the first southern koala to be born in Europe after its mum moved to the UK. Now we've proved that it can work and we will come to understand more about how to raise koalas and breed them elsewhere outside of South Australia. That's Professor Chris Daniels, Australia's Koala Life Chair. Its mum, Violet, is one of four koalas flown from Australia to Longleat Safari Park in 2018 as part of a World First Conservation Programme. Here's Chris Burr, one of Longleat's koala keepers. There is so little known out there. They just curl up into a ball in a tree and um, it's difficult to tell whether they're healthy or not healthy, what they're eating, what diseases they have. We're trying to learn to, to be able to help them. One of the biggest challenges of the programme was developing a plantation filled with native Australian trees. Their food and climate are a key part to a successful pregnancy. It's often driven by the, the weather um, and how rich the, the leaves are and whether they're full of water and nutrients. So that's a really important part. If all of the bits come right, then they'll breed and they'll breed very well. Born six months ago, the baby spent the start of its life safely inside its mum's pouch. The keepers don't know the gender of the joey yet, but hope to once it begins to spend more time outside. It'll remain largely dependent on its mother until it's a year old. Whilst this baby koala is a first, there's hope of more little ones popping up soon. This has been the Sunday 7. Wherever you're listening, do us a favour and hit the follow button. We'll be back tomorrow at 7am with the regular Smart 7. Have a great rest of your weekend. Written, produced and published by Daft Doris.